Today's podcast is brought to you by Plant Strong Foods. Check out our growing assortment of insanely delicious, 100% whole food, plant-based goodness at plantstrongfoods.com. And you can save 10% off your first order with the code RIP10. That's my name, RIP, followed by the number 10. You have this opportunity. Like, there's so much going on in the world that we have no control over. We, we, there's so much that is out of our hands. But one thing that we get to decide is what we put on our fork and what we put into our body. And it's really, instead of it being a judgmental thing without, because I try so hard to get rid of guilt and shame, like I want to excise that from the weight loss nutrition mm -hmm. paradigm. That's, that's where I started. And it's more of an empowering statement. You get to choose you now and again and again and again. And it all happens in this very moment. We have no control over what happened in the past. Can't redo it. We don't know what's going to happen down the pipeline. No, no, we're not psychic. All we have is right now. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plan Strong podcast. The mission at Plan Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Hello, my Plan Strong papayas. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Plan Strong podcast, where each and every week we shine a bright light on stories, research, recipes, and books from some of the preeminent thought leaders and disruptors in the ever-growing plant-based movement. Today, my guest is one of the brightest lights, and there aren't many who have as much passion as Juliana Hever. She is the OG, original gangster, plant-based dietitian. I had Juliana as a guest last year, but since then, her most recent book, the Choose You Now Diet was released, and it has been instrumental in helping thousands of people lose weight for the last time. Today, we're going to dig into weight loss and specifically her 10 tenets for lasting weight loss and health gains. And I hate to tell you this, but there's nothing sexy or glamorous about losing weight. There isn't a hack to health, but there are small steps that you can take at every single meal to choose you now just by deciding what you put on your fork and into that body of yours. For decades, Juliana has worked with thousands of clients and today we stress the importance and joy of choosing yourself again and again and again. All right, plant strong people. We have Juliana Hever back in the house. Let me get a big plant strong kale. Yeah. 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 One of the OGs of the plant based movement. You wrote, God, plant, plant based. Was it, what was the title of that first book in 2011? Well, they first called it the Complete Idiot's Guide to Plant-Based Nutrition, and now it's like Idiot's Guide, Plant-Based Nutrition Idiot's Guide. It's been evolving over the years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as we talked about the first time I had you on the podcast, probably 10 months ago, I think you may, you may have been the first person to utilize the term plant-based in a book. And wow, as we talked about in that episode, it's crazy what plant-based, you know, anything is doing these days. And, um, and you were one of the original gangsters. So, <laughs> it, was a village. it was a village. It's extraordinary how it yeah. has evolved. It is just mind blowing. We never could have predicted that it would be this ubiquitous. No, no, it is. It is truly exactly where we need to be at this point in time. Yep. And as you said, yes, it, it takes a village and this village is doing everything we can to make it happen. So, what I want to talk about today with you, Juliana, 
is a topic that I know is very near and dear to your heart. In fact, you wrote a book that literally just came out a few months ago called The Choose You Now Diet. And really, it's all about losing weight for the last time. And you also have 75 delicious recipes here. But I want you, you and I, to have a riveting conversation for my, my listeners that are out there that are they're sick and tired of yo-yo diets, losing weight, gaining it back, losing weight, whether they're doing whatever dietary plan that's out there, whether they're doing plant-based. And in reading your book and the experience that you've had over however many, I'm just going to say 15 years, coaching literally thousands of different people, you have a, an amazing roadmap for people really from soup to nuts on everything that they can do to make sure they truly are losing weight for the last, the last time. So what I'd love to do with you today is I want to dive in. Um, I think the best way for, for us to start is maybe you could talk before we dive into the 10 tenants that you talk about for sustainable weight loss. I'd love for you to just talk about what motivated you to write this book to begin with? Thank you so much, Rip. Yes, yeah. this was like my life. I, this is the most personal book I've ever written. And it's so close to me because it's why everything happened in my life. Like I started as a dancer in Los Angeles. Like my mom says, I danced before I could walk. And I remember growing up in front of the mirrors doing polyburets, polyburets and pirouettes and, you know, all of those little dance moves. And watching, you know, as a little girl, you start changing. And I was starting at like 10, 11 years old. I started seeing like, oh, like my waist come in. And like, you start to see your body kind of shifting in front of the mirror because you're there yeah. every day, you know, with your colleagues. And one day, I, I must have been around 10, 11, my dance teacher called out to me from across the room in front of all of my fellow ballerinas, Juliana, cut out your snacks. Oh. <laughs> and I like wanted to the floor to swallow me up is how I describe it. Like it was like, whoa. And I didn't realize what that meant at the time. Like I didn't realize how profound an impact this would make on the trajectory of my entire life and career. But it started me thinking about nutrition and diet and body image and weight and what am I supposed to eat and all of that. And of course the dance industry is really, you know, it, it lends itself to this because you have to be a certain mm -hmm. physique to be in the ballet. But then I further went on, I started reading about all this stuff. And then I further went on, I became an actress because I'm in Los Angeles and that's what we do here, a lot of us. And so <laughs> while I was studying acting, I was, I was actually at an arts high school and I was you know, doing a lot of that. And I finally, my parents let me get an agent and I was going out and doing a little bit of modeling and a little bit of acting. And I had a manager tell me, because I was going out for leads, like that was just kind of the parts that I was going for. And my agent or manager told me, she's like, you need to lose a few pounds for the camera. So I was like, okay. She's like, I said, I'm already exercising. I eat really healthy. And I was never like overweight, but I was, you know, it's camera. So she's like, I'll hook you up with my trainer. She's amazing. I'm like, okay. So I started with this trainer, fell in love with personal training, fell in love with it. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this while I act on the side. But then as soon as I became a personal trainer, everyone started asking me, well, what am I supposed to eat? Mm. And I don't want to just kind of regurgitate. There's like a chapter in the personal training handbook that you you take, you know, you study to get your um, certification. And I don't just want to spit out information. I wanted to really understand. And again, I've been studying this my entire life. Like I was fascinated with nutrition and diet and weight loss and all that. So I was like, that's it. I'm going back to school. I just graduated from undergrad and I um, enrolled at, um, for a graduate school program in nutrition and to get my RD. And that was it. I absolutely fell in love with it. So I felt like at that point, I was able to revisit all the things I had kind of bumped up in throughout this reading and, and learning about this, this, this curiosity I had. And that was it. I was on a mission to understand this. And it took me, I don't know, that was so long ago. And now I'm 17 years as a dietitian and working with hundreds of probably thousands of people, definitely hundreds one on one. Uh, and this is basically an accumulation of all that I aggregated in my education, in my personal experience, and then these gorgeous, deep conversations with my clients. I only take a few clients on at a time and we get mm. so intimate and I we go through it, like what's underneath it. It's not because anyone can half follow a diet. Like I refuse to do meal plans. I'm like this anti-dietitian dietitian. 
I'm not going to give you a meal plan because it's like teaching a person to fish rather than giving them mm. the fish or the tofu or whatever we want to call it. Yeah. And um, so it's like these conversations that have evolved about getting underneath of the why we eat, the way we eat, why we make these decisions. And I just had a client today. She's a world renowned psychologist. And she was like, she understands how important, you know, how primal food is and how important it is to go underneath so that you're solving the issue and you're losing weight for the last time and getting off that awful roller coaster that you alluded to that so many people struggle with. Well, and just the title of the book, right? The Choose You Now. Tell me about the title. Why that title? Right, right. And that's what evolved out of these conversations that, that, that I'm, I feel like these people that are my clients become like, like I'm so vested in them and I know so much about their lives and we get so deep into it. And it, you know, this whole mindfulness thing that is kind of really coming to the surface globally. I think that no one really has unique ideas. We all kind of have them as they, they just kind of come out at the state. I've learned a lot about that and the idea of being in the moment and present and that together with these conversations with my clients, it's, you have this opportunity. Like there's so much going on in the world that we have no control over. We, we, there's so much that is out of our hands. But one thing that we get to decide is what we put on our fork and what we put into our body. And it's really, instead of it being a judgmental thing without, cause I've tried so hard to get rid of guilt and shame. Like I want to excise that from the weight loss nutrition mm -hmm. paradigm. That's, that's where I started. And it's more of an empowering statement. You get to choose you now and again and again and again. And it all happens in this very moment. We have no control over what happened in the past. Can't redo it. We don't know what's going to happen down the pipeline. No, no, we're not psychic. All we have is right now. So it's choosing you and choosing you now. Yeah. Yeah. In a society that is so insanely noisy and disruptive right now and <clears throat> where so many people care what other people think about what they're doing and you just gotta like you gotta focus on you i think it's perfect you also talk about the modern day trifecta that we have going on right now uh when it comes to like this ubiquitous temptation for example that's everywhere right everywhere and it's hard i always tell everyone right off the bat like i don't try to pretend or sugarcoat this there's nothing sexy or fun or entertaining about having to lose weight and having to create this deficit it sucks and life happens and i was out last night with my best friend and my sister we had this like impromptu party and everyone's eating their impossible salads and their burgers and their little and i'm just like sitting there like, I'm not going to eat that stuff. And it's like, I had to say no to things that were totally tempting. And my, my best friend's like, just have a bite, one bite, just one bite. And yeah. everyone normalizes. It's like, we come together over food, which is great. And you are beautiful the way you show and talk about coming together and breaking bread as a family. Like you are the role model family of that. But, um, but in every, but mostly day to day, you know, I don't have a lot of plant-based friends barely at all where I live. Like I have them around the world, but the people that I see day to day, my family, no one's really in that same boat. So personally, I could attest to this, this bombardment of temptation. And for me, I have, you have to want to stay on plan so much. So you have to have such a powerful why and want it so bad that you will say no to these temptations day after yeah. day, whenever, yeah, you plan them accordingly. Yeah. And you also talk about the normalization and you touched upon it, but the normalization of overeating in the society where it seems like everywhere you go, you're being asked to, to basically eat, eat more than we, than we ever should. And you also brilliantly talk about how as a species, we have this evolutionary physiology to always want to make sure that we're getting enough to eat. Right. <laughs> And oh my gosh, it's, that's the trifecta is that we are, we're biological beings. We are humans. Okay. And our bodies are adapted to survive, which is great. That's why we're here. That's why our, our generations before led us to be here now. And never in history have we had an opportunity where like, you know, like if you've got hyper palatable, high calorically dense food right in front of you, you should eat that to survive. Like that is built into our DNA to like stay here and, and thrive because there's not going to be all of this high caloric, uh, hyper palatable things available. We don't know when it'll be around next. 
And yet that's not how we are anymore because now it's 24 seven DoorDash, all those companies that like, you can get anything on your doorstep delivered anytime. And so of course our biology is fighting with our psychology and our desires. And it's like this, this, this what, what would you call it? This fusion of insanity. It is, it is. It's very antagon antagonistic. And I think it is so important for people to realize that once you understand what's going on and why there's this, these kind of opposing forces, then you understand, Oh, it's, you know, I understand why I'm drawn to that, but I also understand why I don't need to eat that. Right. Why I don't need to go there. Um, so let's dive into, so you talk about these 10 tenets of sustainability. The first three that you talk about, it's all about choice right? You choose, you choose. And the first one that you talk about is what is your, like, what's your purpose? What's your why? So talk to me about that. <laughs> yes. So yes. In fact, this evolved, the 10 tenants to sustainable weight loss evolved because I had a weight loss support group and I, I wanted to tell them what to do before I had this book. And this is what fleshed out into this whole book, like the whole concept yeah. stuff here, but it all starts with choosing. Okay. So why, why do you want this? You have to want it. You, I, my, the way I say it is you could lead a human to healthy, but you can't make them eat. And I've had this exemplified around me forever. I've talked about, I think we spoke about last year when my father had a stroke and he came out of the stroke and he was like, Joel, you have to want it. And he, even with a second chance at life, he didn't want it. And so there was nothing I could do or say to make him want it. And my clients too, I have so many clients that come to me, I really want to lose weight. I'm like, well, do you really want to lose weight? Like, do you really want this? What does it look like to you? And that's the first thing I have my clients do when they really are ready. You have to be ready for this. I have them write it out because words are so powerful and putting them yeah. into writing or typing or whatever, where it's more reality. It's like, it's creating it. It's making it more um, visceral. And I want people to see and feel what does it look like when you're in the driver's seat, you have full control over what you eat and your body, your body image and how much you weigh, because you really do get to decide how much you weigh. It sounds crazy, but you do. Yeah. yeah. And um, you also talk about how to be a lighthouse instead of a tugboat, which I think is, is, is wonderful. And I know so many people that they're trying to pressure people or figure out ways to get people to, to eat this way when the reality is it usually never never works as you just said right you can lead somebody to healthy but like your father even right even and, my and, father and, and yeah, where is like, he where is he today oh no he's back eating oh it's awful i can't even talk i make i, I can't even sit there when he's eating it's been awful um yeah it's he's okay. but he's fine he had this little miracle thing and so i don't know i don't know it's it's awful for me but like even just even professionally forget my personal part which is really hard and emotional for me you know obviously because i care so much but even in my professional life as a dietitian with these clients my first 10 years i was trying to convince everyone no you need to eat plant-based look at the study look at dr esselstyn's or look at like all these things and i realized wait why i was bumping my head against the wall I'm like why am i not like i really wanted to be successful and help everyone and I realized, no, 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 I have to find the people that want this. And then I will love them all the way through this process. But I'm going to stop trying to convince people. And wow, now everyone that I work with, we have the results because they already come in knowing, like I tell them what to expect. You have to want it. There's no yeah. way around it. Well, I just had somebody email me this morning saying, Rip, will you talk to my brother? He's like, he's sick. He's got all these issues going on. He really could use your help. And I was like, listen, the only way that this works is if your brother reaches out to me, if, 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 I, if, if you connect your brother and me and we have a conversation, it's not going to go well, especially if he's, you know, uh, going into this conversation, kicking and screaming. So hundred percent, never, never works, never works. Mm -hmm. works. So Juliana, let's go on to tenant number two, which is find your goal weight. I, I mean, so you're actually sitting down with your um with your clients and discussing how much weight they want to lose yep so we use both objective and subjective decision making the objective is a formula called the hamley formula and it's really standard used with you know in in nutrition and it's basically a formula based on 
height and gender. So women should be uh, about 100 pounds per five feet and then five pounds each inch after that. And for men, it's 106 pounds and then six pounds per inch after that. So I'm 5'4", I should be 120 plus or minus 10%, which uh -huh. is a broad range. It's like, I don't know math very well off the top of my head, but it's a broad range. And then, so that's like a healthy range. And um, a lot of my clients that have been overweight or obese their entire lives or for their entire adult life, and everyone around them is used to seeing them a certain way, when they start dropping down towards this range, their friends and family will say to them, oh, are, do you have a problem? I think you've lost too much because we're just not used to seeing them like that. So it's good to have an objective standard to kind of utilize as a baseline. And then we add in things like, how do you feel in your clothes? And how are your workout recoveries? And how do you feel energetically? And then we kind of figure that out. And you really do get to decide, like, you know, we, we all wiggle about five to 10 pounds throughout our lives with holidays and celebrations and, and stress and all this stuff that just kind of we bounce a little bit. But choosing that range, people really get to do. And then we work because I, I get my clients to have a PhD in their body in weight loss. And then I have yeah. them a separate PhD in their body in weight maintenance so that they can maintain this and be off the diet roller coaster. So get, just so for example, let's say I was to meet with you and we were to determine, so it's a range. So if I'm like, let's say I'm 280 pounds, would we say I want to get down to somewhere between 180 and 200 pounds? Well, Is that how that works? <laughs> well, using, using the how my why formula, I would be. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm six two, I'm six two. Okay, so for six two, you would be. So I I need a calculator, but it's like so it's 106 plus 14 plus times six. 14 times six, so ten. That that'd be. Uh, let's see, ten times six, it'd be 84. 84 to that. To okay. 106. So, so that's the, about 190. Then, Okay, great. And then you would add 10% on either side of that. And then you get to decide within that window. Like, how do you feel best? Where do you want to live? Like, where do you feel oh. really good at? Got it. Huh. All right. Um, and all right. So we've figured out my, my, my goal weight. Um, what's next? Do I have to choose a, like my timeline? Is that right? Totally. Because you can, well, I like to rip off the bandaid with my clients that want to rip off the bandaid. And it's really kind of like extraordinary. Like this is a thing that I'm so excited about because it is so predictable. And this is what has taken me all this time to kind of really, I could predict to the T what's going on with people. And my clients lose between 0.4 and 0.8 pounds of body fat a day starting at the start date until the end date. So oh. you could do it, that's rapid fire, right? And so we, we mitigate for the potential risks of uh, rapid weight loss, but it's it's really, it's totally safe. Like we, the thing I worry about, and I have clients, like I had someone start yesterday who was on hypertensive meds and I, you know it changes so fast. Like I have people get off the meds so fast that they have to be really careful. So it's very um, scientific and it's really calculating. We're very conscientious about it, but, um, yeah. Or there's people that are like, you know what? Oh, and I'll have them like take a break from exercise just so they're like not revving up their appetite because that's a kind of a controversial view, which we could talk about. Well, no, uh, I do. I, I do want to talk about it. And it's one of like my talking points because um, I've never heard that before. So I'd love to dive into that. Yeah. Yeah, later, we will. Later. Um, later. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. And just the other part of that is that some people are like, I really want to keep exercising for my sanity, which absolutely get that. It's the most important thing for mental health and mood. So um, we'll go a little slower, like the standard one to two pounds a week. So I get to, I, you know, I want, I'll help anyone where they're at. I just want to help them reach their goals in the, the most, the easiest way, best way for them at that time. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, what is a standard timeline that most people pick? Is it six months? Is it a year? Or is it just? It depends. Complete? So it depends if they're going rapid fire, then we, I could calculate for them. Okay. 0.4 to 0.8 pounds a day will take you this much time. So again, now let's say they have 20 pounds to lose. I work with people that have like 80 to 100 pounds to lose. So then I calculate how long will it take on between 0.4 and 0.8 pounds a day. Thank goodness for calculators um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to go to that weight and, and this rate at this rate of loss. And then stuff gets in the way, you know, so like we compensate or we deal with all the stuff. Like that's where the good stuff comes in. Because again, I published all this in this book, not to put myself out of business, but because the stuff that comes out during this process, that's where the magic happens. That's where the transformation occurs. So according to your, I have a calculator here. So if I, if I, if, if I want to lose, um, 20 pounds, if I'm losing half 
a pound, if, I, if I'm doing that right, half a pound a day of body, of body fat, then it would take me 20 days. No, I'm sorry. 40, 20, 40 days to lose 20 pounds. About an average. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you the range. Like it could be up to yeah. whatever. I'd have to calculate it. I would do point. I always calculate it times 0.4 to 0.8. A lot of people, if they're coming to me with standard Western diet, a lot of people are. They want to go plant-based or people on a very hyper, um, you know, like the high processed vegan mm -hmm. diet. Mm -hmm. uh, those people, especially on the, the standard Western diet, when they transition that first week or two, they're like dropping a pound or two, a pound or 1.2 pounds a day just because there's all this fluid that they're purging from their body. Mm. Well, that I find that really, I've never seen it that kind of pinpointed like, okay, you want to lose 45 pounds. We can do that together in 63 days. <laughs> right. I know. And then the clients at the end are like, I can't, they don't, no one believes me until they're living it. They're like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. It's, yeah, it's exciting. Really All about right. It. Wow. So let's let's go into tenants number four through 10, which you have under the subset of systemization. And, and the first one is, of course, duh, eat whole plant-based foods. Uh, I don't know what you want to say about that, but, you know, I mean, I do like the way you say in your book, avoid the macronutrient confusion that so many people get hung up on. Mm hmm. Yeah, I know. It's it's hilarious. Like the whole plant thing is just I always say eat plants, whole plants, nothing but the plants. So help your health. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the way to do it. But yeah, the macro confusion is something I'm very passionate about. It's just like the fact that we're so confused and hung up on carbs, protein and fat. And like there is no perfect ratio. No one's ever concluded a perfect ratio. People lose weight and get healthy on all mm -hmm. sorts of the spectrum of that. And I wish we could stop talking about macros and get back to food. It would change yeah. everything. Yeah. And you also talk about uh, under that tenant, you talk about fatopia. Mm -hmm. Fat phobia. Fat phobia. Fat phobia. Fat -phobia. Yes. Fat. yes. People are afraid of fat. And we need some essential fats in our diet. I mean, there's no, that's why it's essential by definition. And so people have this hack of if you cut out fat, what you can't do completely, but if you cut out fat as much as you can, you can eat as much as you want. And I think that I get a lot of people that are recovering from that idea and it perpetuates this fear of fat and also this, um, this binge thing. I, I work with a lot of people that are recovering from binging and, you know, and that's kind of been a, the fundamental core of their, their weight problems over their life. And, uh, and that idea that you can eat as much as you want and then they can't, they're not losing weight. And why am I broken? What's wrong with me? So I think those two things are mitigated by getting rid of the conversation about protein, carbs, and fat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and you just mentioned, you said, well, why am I broken? And I'm, sh I mean, I, I hear it all the time. I've got an overactive, you know, uh, thyroid. I've got a slow metabolism, uh, all these things. And you in the very, very beginning of this book say, it's the food, you know, I hate to break yeah. it to you, but it's the food. And and this there's no magic secret here. This is easy stuff. Simple but not easy because um, it's deep and it's right. socialized and it's biological. And we're living in this world where it's weird if you say no to yeah. an impossible burger or whatever it is, or to say I'm not eating dessert, or it's it's amazing. It's amazingly challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And and Another thing about eating a whole food plant-based diet that, you know, I, I, I go into um, intensely is the whole thing around calorie density. I don't think we need to go too deeply into that, but um, I'd love for you to just say a few words about calorie density because it's really important. Absolutely. And I kind of, I like the way I um, was, I was showing people how to, because I've talked about this for years, to, we've talked about this forever, but um in this book, I kind of said how to use it and how to make it, you know, doable. Like, how do you actually use this in your life? And so like volumizing, you know, using, you know, fluffing everything out with more vegetables and mushrooms and fruits and stuff that are lower calorie density. And then I think maximizing something like where you have them as the star of the show. Like I have a spaghetti squash lasagna. That's the spaghetti squash is the star of the show or stuffed mushrooms or the mushrooms or the pepper, whatever it is where you're making these like lower calorie density foods, the star of the meal, the center of the plate 
because we're used to seeing it differently. Yeah. And I mean, God, you're so brilliant to talking about this. I, I still like my mouth waters just listening, like thinking about how you talk about food, like in our interview on my podcast. Oh, <laughs> like, right, right, right. But yeah, so there's just different ways to just apply food density and then lowering your intake of the higher calorie density food. So in practical terms, I have the six daily threes where it's like have one to two ounces of nuts and seeds a day. That's how you would implore, like make that part of your diet rather than 20% fat. Like who can calculate that really? Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let's move on to the next tenant, which is, and I think that before I say it, I'm going to say, I think this is just a really, really difficult one for Americans that are so used to just, you know, eating more and more and more. And that is recognizing hunger and satiety. And, 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 and how do you do it? How do you reprogram, you know, your eyes, your stomach, you know, all the, all those sensations. So what do you do? <laughs> so I literally, I can't tell you how many people I work with that say, I honestly don't know when I'm really hungry and I don't know how to stop. Like I don't have an off switch. So I understand that part, but let's talk about recognizing hunger. We yeah. eat because of the time of day, because other people are eating, because it's just, it's, we're supposed to eat every couple hours to fuel our metabolism, all of the reasons, but what's real hunger. And I've heard it described in different ways, but here's how I do it. So there's that scale of like, let's say zero to 10 and zero is like, you're super empty, hungry. Everything sounds amazing. And there's like a 10 where you've had Thanksgiving and then you had an extra serving of pie and you're like stuffed and nothing sounds good. Like you don't even want to think about what you're eating for the next week. Like it's well. And so I use the celery stick test as a gauge because this to me helps. It's that I love celery, but it's not like something I'd be like, oh, I want celery. You know, like I'm craving celery. It's not like a craveable food. Necessarily. Sorry to celery. I don't mean to insult celery. But if you think about it, like I'm like the hungrier I get, the more that celery stick sounds good. I actually had this experience on the plane the other day because I was flying and I had celery with me and I was like, oh, am I hungry enough for my celery stick? And so I waited until oh, that celery stick is starting to sound better and better. And I knew that that was actual hunger. All the gotcha. others said the headaches and the the um, dizziness or all that shakiness, that's not hunger. Because if you think about it from, again, from the adaptive evolutionary perspective, when you're hungry, you need to hunt and gather. You need energy. You need to feel good. You need to be sharp and, and on it with mentally. So all these things that we kind of think of as hunger aren't necessarily hunger. I think it's often from that idea of like, it's like detoxification symptoms and stuff like that right. rather than hunger. Unless, <clears throat> unless your 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 blood sugar has really gotten too low, which I mean, <laughs> yeah. considering considering that you know we now have almost a third of Americans that are either pre diabetic or type two diabetic, which is right. just kind of so sad. Yes, and yeah. avoidable for most. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. So. Now that celery stick, does that also include if you have a little bit of peanut butter on it or has it got to be plain celery stick? Yeah, but that, that sounds amazing. So you make food, so you have this gift rip of making food sound so delicious. Like you should just, I don't know, you could do like all these like audio books uh, on food. <laughs> you're too, you're too kind. All right. Well, and so that's hunger. What about, what about satiety? That's, I think that's the hardest part of all of this. And like I said, I don't have an off switch. I love to eat. I love food so much. I've made it my entire life. It's food. And when something tastes good, I don't want to stop. And I could shut down. I could like ignore all those like, oh, I'm getting really full. And like, I should stop eating. I'm really good at ignoring that. And that's, you know, it's a problem. So I had to teach myself. What I've done is I've kind of studied these naturally lean people and I've kind of looked at how they kind of do things. And then I've utilized those behaviors. And it's kind of like taking an exogenous stimulus and utilizing it as a tool. So for example, when I'm eating something that's really good, I put away the ex the bowl. Like, like I'm going to go eat after we hang up. That's why I'm pointing at my big old <laughs> potato salad that I can't wait to dig into. But um, I'll put away the extras. And so I have to go have an extra step to get more. But I also, if I'm really eating, because you know that hand to mouth behavior, it's like you just keep going. It's like, oh, this is really good. It's hard to stop. So what I have to do externally is I put it to the side and I tell myself, it's a mindfulness technique. I say, okay, mm -hmm. one minute, one minute. So I'll go and I'll answer a text or check my Instagram or whatever, just for one minute, just a distraction to stop that behavioral pattern. And then I'm like, okay, am I, can I stop now? And that's, that's where the, it's like a game. It's almost like a game. You have to, it's a like gamifying this, um, 
programming that we have to help you get in touch with what you're not really listening to. Yeah. Well, and as you talk about <clears throat> in the book is it takes, I mean, it requires practice and patience. And um, I mean, would you say in working with, you know, clients over the years, is this something that some people pick up in a matter of weeks and some people are just, you know, months? Um, just it's depends. A it's a good question. It depends. It totally depends. And um, it's a great question. And I think that's the, the satiety. I think hunger is a lot easier for a lot of people. That could be days. But the satiety, I mean, I'm still working on it. I've been doing it forever. I'm still like learning it myself. It's it's something that takes very much uh, mindful practice. And yeah. yeah. Well, like for myself, for example, I find that um, like dinner last night um, had three different types of potato, a lentil oat loaf, three huge like fistful servings of steamed kale on this big plate. And I finished it and I was like, you know, I could go back for more, but I've got, I, I've got plenty. I mean, I've got plenty of calories, nutrition, green leafies. I'm good to go. And, um, and that was it. Um, but I could have easily gone back for another plate, <laughs> right? And, See, and you're that naturally lean person. So like, what was, what it talk about that? Like, what was that like for you? Like that moment of, ah, I'm done. How did you, how did you, I wouldn't do that. I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get some more. Well, I, um, well, to your point, I basically, we were having a dinner conversation. We were all sitting around the table. And so instead of going and getting more, I just sat there for a while. And then about 10 minutes later, my stomach was like, no, dude, you are good. You don't need any more. As good as that was, and, and as much as you think you want more, you don't need more, right? So that was kind of the, now that you're bringing it out of me, the internal conversation that I have with myself. And yeah, so, and see, it was like you created space, like just a few minutes, and it yeah. told your stomach, told your brain, because that's true too. Like the receptors, the stretch receptors in the stomach have to tell the brain, and sometimes there's a little gap between that. So creating that space is everything. That's where the magic happens. Yeah, and you know, you know, Dan Butner talks about that. Uh, the Japanese have that term like hari achikui, right? Which means Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So, which you eat until you're 80% full. And so that's kind of, it's like a, it's like a mindfulness kind of, you know, technique that I think we could all uh, afford to try and master that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love Hari Hachibu. I talked about that in vegetarian diet and that's, it's exactly right. But see now most people, including myself, like I have to learn what is 80% full mean and feel like. So we mm -hmm. practice that in our sessions. Like, well, I have my clients kind of really tune in. It's all about tuning in, right? There's no right or wrong. Well, yeah. And this is interesting. And I'm glad we're talking about this because I know for a large majority of my, um, let's just say for, for about 15 years while I was eating a whole food plant-based diet, because I was such a avid athlete, I would almost have to eat until my stomach was uncomfortably full in order for me not to lose too much weight. And so now that I'm not training nearly as much, I have to recalibrate what does, what does your stomach have? Like, what is that feeling of satiety that I need to where I'm good? And it, I don't need my stomach to hurt anymore. Right. I mean, it, it wasn't like this belly ache. But it was this like, okay, there's, there is some pressure that is talking to me and I, I, I try and stop before I get the pressure. You know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. And I work with a lot of athletes where that's exactly where it is. It's like, especially on a plant-based diet where it's more volume and the caloric density is a, is a benefit yeah. for weight loss, but it's maybe a challenge when you're trying to get in enough calorie to perform and compete and, and train and recover. So it is a different, a whole different or mentality and um, set of issues that you kind of have to manage. Yep. So the, the, this next tent that I want to talk to you about is something that I hear about at all at our immersion programs. And these typically are people that um, they have got a relationship with food 
that need some serious mending. And a lot of these people, they have this really addictive relationship with food where if they, they're, they're going like gangbusters fantastically well, and then they have one slice of like cheese pepperoni pizza and they have this downward spiral and before they know it they're you know they're back to being pre-diabetic they've gained 40 pounds and they they're, they're they they wake up in a back alley going what the hell happened to me right yeah and you call this don't break the seal yes i got this from a student slash client one a few years ago and i was like that's brilliant that's exactly what it is and I know my, I always just, I used to describe it as, I know if I have one French fry, well, this is before air fryers and all that, where it was like, but, or if I had one piece of vegan pizza or what, I knew my little triggers. It was like, that was it. I would want the whole pizza. I'd want all the French fries. Last night, my friends were trying to give me that impossible burger salad thing. And I knew if I had one bite, it would be all over for me. Cause it's, it lights, it's a, there's actual chemistry that happens. There's a dopamine hit. It lights up your brain. It feels good. It tastes good. And it's like, yes, yes, more of that, please. And so if you don't have that first bite, you have so much more control and power over the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what, what do you tell your clients? Like, what do they need to do to not take that first bite? Right. So first it comes back to your why. And then I have these things called the emotion to do lists that I have my clients do. So if, okay, so we have a plan. My clients always have a plan. This is what they're eating. This is what time they're eating. And they know what they're doing. Now, any other time that they are about to take a bite and break the seal, that's not on plan. I say, give yourself a minute. Again, mindfulness, one minute. Go, what's going on? And it's usually, I'm stressed out. I'm bored. I'm tired. And they're trying to solve these things with food. And these things, it takes time to recognize. Most people are like, well, it just tastes good. But, you know, but after time and practice, they start to go, oh, I'm stressed. So I have them preemptively keep lists of what to do when I'm stressed. So things that soothe me include, you know, like for me, it's taking a hot bath or going out in nature or petting my dog or whatever, whatever it is. Like, it doesn't matter. Or something more extravagant, like get a massage or plan a trip or whatever it is that's like, for you, that resonates for you. And then I have my clients stop what they're doing before they take that first bite and break the seal and go to their list and pick one of those activities. Mm -hmm. It sounds really kind of like silly, but again, words are so powerful and just like having these things set up, like, I, like it was under that whole category of systematize. It's a system in place to, you know, to stop you and, and reroute you. And it's really helpful and it becomes a habit. Everything about food is habit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, like in our house, we sometimes have the, you know, the, the, the vegan Natamu ice cream, or we have the, um, the plant-based brownies, right. From whole foods or whatever. And I just don't do it. I just don't even have one bite of the brownie or the ice cream. Cause I know if I do, and I know my personality, I will have the whole pint of that Natamu, you know, <laughs> chocolate chunk, cherry Garcia, ice cream, whatever. Right. So, so what's you, how do you stop break for yourself from breaking the seal? I just don't do it. I just don't go there. I just don't go there. I just know it, 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 it. Yeah. I mean, and there's sure there's a little bit of a draw there, but I don't go there just like, I don't like, I don't have a cigarette. Right. I don't, there's, I don't, I just don't do that's something I don't do. Right. I, I don't, I don't eat red meat anymore. I don't do chicken. I just, so I look at that and I'm like, I don't do that. Right. Um, boundaries. You said yeah. boundaries for yourself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that's, that's don't break the seal. Okay. So what about, um, you talk about stop counting and I think so many people are so used to, you know, whether it's Weight Watchers counting points or macros, as we talked about earlier. So how do you teach your clients to stop counting? I know it's like ripping, ripping <laughs> them away from their security blanket. It's torture for so many people. And it's funny to be a dietitian that doesn't count. Like that's what we're taught to do. <laughs> count calories, count macros, count percentage of RDI, blah, 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 blah. Right. And the dietitian, the, the dietitian that doesn't count. Yeah. I like to be a little different, but it's really, it's really disruptive according to the system. But what does it really matter? Like, first of all, no one needs a perfect diet. 
there is no such thing. And if you're, you know, aware of your nutrients, I call them the notable nutrients, and you're aware of hunger satiety and the scale's going down mm. and you're trying for the scale to go down. If you're trying to maintain your weight and the weight is maintaining, or if you're trying to gain weight and the weight's going up, then you're doing all it right, eating enough or eating the right amount. So why sit there and, and it drives people crazy. People are obsessed with the counting and then, and then it doesn't really do anything for like how many people, I mean, some people have some success, but then it gets, it just gets obsessive for a lot of people. So I just find that it's much more helpful. My, my way of my whole philosophy is just to go within your body has a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Well, I really love that. And I love that it doesn't make eating a scientific experiment any longer. And it's very, it seems like it's very liberating and freeing uh, for many people, probably for the first time that they can remember. Yeah. And what a gift, what a gift. <laughs> yeah. Food can be, I mean, not only, we don't have to use food as, you know, it doesn't have to be so scientific and, you know, for, we have these parameters or boundaries, it should be enjoyable and pleasurable. We should really get in touch with our body. It's a beautiful opportunity to get to know how we feel and how we are in this world and why we eat and enjoy the food and like be more present in all parts of our life. Yeah. Um, this next tenant that you talk about, Juliana, um, it's one that's gotten to me a lot of attention as of late. And it's like, you talk about it's set a schedule and there should be like maybe a designated window in which you, in which we eat as opposed to this steady state where we're in this fed, you know, fed state all throughout the day. And, you know, there's intermittent fasting and stuff like that. So I'd love for you to tell me, like, how do you, how do you work with this, with your clients, this, this setting a schedule of when to eat? Yes. Well, we are incredibly tied, uh, tied into our circadian rhythms and, I've been so fascinated by the literature coming out on our circadian clocks and our the hormonal changes throughout the day and through our monthly cycles, our daily cycle, all those beautiful cycles. And we are creatures of habit. So the other research that I've been really interested in is health span and longevity. And mm. the fasting data is extraordinary. It's very, very promising in terms of health outcomes and health span and longevity. And so I tie that into this where there's a lot of physiological benefits to not being in the fed state all the time, but there's a lot of behavioral benefits. In fact, there was a new study that just came out saying that there was no benefit for weight loss with intermittent fasting. Hmm. And yeah, just, just this last week, I thought, Oh gosh, that's interesting. And so my take on that is, I think we need more information. It was a smaller group. I was, it's interesting though. We have to keep looking at all the data and I'm open to hearing all of it. But even if that were true, even though the, if you look at the majority of evidence looks very, very supportive, even if that were true, Every time you have to make about a decision about food, it makes things more complicated. And it's estimated we make about 200 food decisions a day. So if we give ourselves some restriction and say, okay, I'm just going to eat between the 12 and six every day, you know, first bite to last bite, then first of all, you get all that time in the fasted state to do all the metabolic house cleaning that needs to take place, you know, getting rid of cancer cells and virus cells and all that stuff that we're, you know, bombarding our systems rather than all of our energy going towards digestion and absorption, which is a very labor intensive process. So that part is great. But behaviorally speaking, like if I know I'm eating at 12 and I'm eating at five, I don't have to make any more decisions about that. So I think mm -hmm. that psychologically for my clients and the weight loss process is enormously effective. So do you, do you find with a lot of your clients, are you specifically trying to have them eat like twice a day, three times a day? Uh, what, what do you find works best? What I found, and this is all anecdote, this is not scientific, but what I found with most of my clients, it's twice a day. Usually is the best for most people. And that, and that's what usually like noon and five ish. Like I always tailor it for them. I, there's some benefit that eating earlier, like shifting your window, your fed window earlier in the day is a little bit more efficacious, but a lot of my clients have families and it's important to them to sit down with their spouse and their children or whoever they live with to have dinner. And so then we prioritize dinner and then we have the, the first meal a little bit earlier. So I make it work with their schedule because again, the science is still emerging and evolving. And I think there's some evidence that um, you could do, it's like an eight hour window or a 12 hour window. So there's wiggle room. And I just want to find what works for everyone individually. This is where the 
inter-individual variability comes into play and I want to make it work so that it's sustainable. If you're fighting it every day, it's like, oh, oh, I can't have dinner with my kids. I can't have, and everyone's complaining and you're miserable. You're not going to, this is not for life. This is not sustainable. So let's make it sustainable for your life specifically. Mm -hmm. I find that really, really fascinating. So I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. Uh, so uh, do you tell your clients to have a large variety of different foods to eat from? especially when they're starting out or to keep it super simple and not have too much variety. One of the tenants in there is repetition. And, you know, I proved all of these points back to myself in opposition. When I wrote this book, I love, and I hate that I have to say this, but I wrote a diet book, a diet cookbook and gained weight while writing it because there was a deadline and 75 recipes. And I had to have a lot of variety and a lot and ate more frequently and more volume. All the stuff I talk about, I had to do the opposite. And so I reverse engineered it and proved my point in the opposite direction, which is crazy ironic. But um, repetition is okay. We mostly are repetitive creatures of habit anyway. Like most of us rotate through the same meals, like one or two breakfasts, two or three or four lunches, five or six dinners yeah. in a week. So variety is like, it makes things, oh, it's like, this tastes really good. I forgot how good this is. I'm going to have a couple extra bites. And if you're trying to create a deficit, that gets in the way. So repetition during weight loss is a good thing. It's your friend. Find those recipes that you love and just do a little bit of, you know, just go back and forth. Or most of my clients, by the end of their process, especially if they have like 80 to 100 pounds to lose, they end up with about, I want to say like six or four, even four to six recipes that they know will be effective for weight loss and they love them. They're satiating and all these things that they just tend to gravitate towards. So a little bit of repetition. And then we bring back maintenance with the variety, adding in a little bit more variety. Okay. Got it. Um, all right. Let's, let's go back to the, the tenants. So tenant number nine is monitor meal volume. And then you specifically say in there, practice radical self-compassion as well. I think when, when you, when you mess up, but what is, what does monitor meal volume mean exactly? Simply stated, if you're getting on the scale day after day and it's not going down, you're eating too much. I know it sounds crazy and radical. That's it. You're eating too much. You have to rein it in if you want to lose. And right. so it means look at how much you're eating and maybe you could eat a one bite less and see what happens. But the radical self-compassion piece, I learned this from Catherine, this woman I've worked with for many, many years. She's kind of like yeah. a spiritual life coach type of psychologist just and she started talking about radical self-compassion a couple of years ago and I thought that was brilliant because oh my gosh rip we beat ourselves up and the conversations I have with people and how hard we are on ourselves and the, the horrible things we say to ourselves like mm -hmm. the, like the stuff that goes on that we don't even say out loud that we may not even be aware of is happening is so loud and if we could just practice more self. I mean, I do it too. It's like, no matter, even no matter how much you think about it, it's like, we don't even recognize how predominant those words are. And so I try to like replace, like replace some of it, like one sentence to say, Oh, like for me, here's my perfect example. When I am busy and I'm having a crazy day and I make myself get to the gym, even though it's like, I have so many things I need to do that are more like feel, feeling imminent. If I get to the gym or when I get to the gym and I get out of the gym, I give myself an actual pat on the back and I say, good job, Jules. <laughs> Because it's like some positive reinforcement of the good things. You know, something you just say something positive to yourself as much as possible. Yeah, it is so important that we that we do our best to really love ourselves, right? And so many of us, we do. We have a lot of self hate, and um, and we're not very kind to ourselves. Um, mm, so important. Um, as far as so, you mentioned getting on the scale. You, you think it's important, especially for people for sustainable weight loss. And as you're going on this journey with weight loss, that you actually weigh yourself every single day. Can you tell me why that is? Yes. I'm again, trying to get rid of guilt and shame and yeah. radical self-compassion and know that it's a tool. And I say that you're not getting on the scale and the scale's looking up at you and saying, like my dance teacher said, you know, mm, eating too much cookies up there. You know, like it's just information. And if we could use it as information and as a guideline, a guidepost. And so for maintenance, like if you get on the scale every day, instead of saying, 
I'll get on the scale Monday. It's like you mess up. Whatever it was my birthday last week. And so it's like, okay, I'm on, I got on the scale the next day. It's like, okay, own it. This is a number. It's just a number. And then you know where you're at. And if you say, I'm going to wait till Monday, or I'm going to wait till January. It's that's when people gain 20, 30, 40 pounds and don't even recognize it because they're just like, ah, la, 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 la. I don't want to see it. But if you could just look at it as information and we're gathering and aggregating as much information as possible and giving less weight to the scale, no pun intended, it can be just a tool just an objective tool. And so do you find with a lot of your clients that they get to a point to where they don't need to look at that scale any longer where they're liberated from it? I don't see it as a liberation. I see it as a tool. That's a good boundary. And I think for maintenance for the long run. So we avoid the roller coaster. I have that as one of the, bound I recommend it as I don't ever tell anyone what to do, but I suggest, yeah. and I, I see that it's more helpful to get on the scale and have that information ongoing. And uh, it's just, it's just data. There's, yeah. there's, no, yeah. 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 That's, um... and, well, I just should say that, you know, fluid shifts happen, hormonal shifts happen, intestinal content shifts happen, shift happens. And so you <laughs> have to <laughs> know that it's not going to be perfect on the scale every day. And so you just think about it, like just, it's just information. Yeah. That's good. That That's good information. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And so that your your tenth tenant, I feel like we've kind of talked about it, but just so people think that I'm not overlooking it, is master monoton monotony, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that is where you talked about how when you increase your your diet your 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 variety, right, you tend to maybe overconsume. Is that correct? Totally. I mean, again, we're creatures of habit, and a little bit of monotony is okay, and it's you know find your, find your recipes that you love and it's okay. It's, it's good. It's good to kind of have that uh, under your, like a new repertoire of things that, you know, works and that's okay. It's temporary. You're not going to go into a nu nutritional deficit by, you know, not having massive variety. And most of us do this anyway. This is kind of like a very natural tendency for most people anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I look at, I'll just <clears throat> myself, you know, I literally, six days a week have the exact same breakfast. I mean, I, I change the fruit and some of the toppings, but it's always, it's either oatmeal or it's my, uh, oh, the, big big bowl. the big bowl cereal that I make. And I, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and make it really. What did you, what did, have you eaten yet today? Have you had breakfast? No. And I just, one more thing about that is that everything about food is habit, right? Everything is, is habit. And so I know I, I do the time restricted eating. I eat at 11 o'clock. So I'm way an hour late now oh. and I'm really hungry, <laughs> but I usually eat at 11 o'clock every day. Like we're just, we're just creatures of habit. You're ready for that celery stock. <laughs> yeah. I've got this really yummy uh, potato salad that I always gravitate towards with the, uh, um, this maple mustard dressing that I, Ooh. yeah. So good. Can't wait. Uh. <laughs> Not that I want to write up up here because I love talking to you. Yeah. So um, you mentioned in your book some, you you call it under the, the header, noteworthy trends that people that you've worked with have had success with. And the first one is um, most people tend to thrive with soups. And why, What what what's the magic with soups? Right. It's so interesting. This is, again, psychology, I think, you know, from my, my again, anecdote. It's that if there's a homogenized recipe that you have, it makes it easier because I think it goes back to the whole food decision making thing. So if you have fewer decisions, like like the people that want to do the bowls where it's like, oh, I'll have a mm, little mm. avocado and a little beans and a little this and a little that. It's more decisions, like how much dressing should I put and how much this should I put and how many. And so when it's just already homogenized into a soup and people go, oh, OK, I put I have about this much. I use this bowl and it's filled to this height with this recipe. Yeah. And they know that that's satisfying. It's almost this predictability that helps with the habit part of it. So that just seems to help people succeed. Yeah. Well, and speaking of soups, you know, I, I don't want to leave out that one of the really spectacular things about this book is the recipe section, right? And just the, the really delicious, oil-free, like low calorie, amazing recipes you have in this book. And for example, I've marked some of the, the chilies and the stews 
and the curry dishes and the soups that I'm going to make out of here. Okay. And for example, for example, the first one, um, and I think it's ingenious the way you have done the recipe section where you got, you've got, you have recipes that are in pots and then it's pans and then it's plates and it's power bowls and then it's secret sauces. <laughs> and, and it's really, you've done a really phenomenal job with it. Um, but, but for starters, for starters, like uh, that Thai green curry. And what I love about it, the first thing I did is I went to see if you have coconut milk in there and you don't, you have coconut extract, right? Yep. Yep. Cause, oh my gosh, I spent time in Thailand and I love the curries and I love, they're so decadent, but they're so decadent and they're, you know, all that saturated fat. And so I love coconut milk. It's amazing. And I, I use it for a day of deliciousness, like when I'm going to Thailand next, whenever that will be. But, um, but yeah, so this is a way to get all that, like that hint of that flavor with the creaminess. Cause I usually use a, so a soy or a cashew milk and you get all that deliciousness without the saturated fat. And so that's kind of fun. It's it. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And then you like, you got a peanut butter vegetable curry that I absolutely am going to try. And I think I might make it with that, that PB powder, right? Yes. Let me know how that comes out. You got to share that with me. That's I will. Great. I, will. Yeah. I will. I'll take a photo. And then you have a, jambal a jambalaya oats. And one of the things that really attracted me to that recipe was you're using oat groats, which I hardly ever see in any recipes any longer. And what I love about that is it, it's the most unprocessed form of an oat. And so is that specifically why you use that? Yeah, actually, that was my fr my friend, Chef Shazzy. She's a friend of mine that was like trying to inspire me with like some different recipe ideas. And that was her idea. And I loved it for the same reason you just said. And yeah. it's when you look it up online to order it, because you don't really find them at the market. Really, it's, I had to order it online. It's like you see it in terms of like feed for animals. Like it's not something we normally right, do. right, yeah, yeah. It's intense, yeah. <laughs> and just for and just for people. Um, so what's the difference between an oat groat and steel cut oats? It's just like you get that refinement process. Like that's the original form. You know, just like I don't. There's always the original form, and then you like refine it a little bit, and it becomes. Um, I don't know the order steel cut and you, you refine it a little more and you get into a flour and you refine it a little more, you puff it and it becomes a, you know, and it just has a different glycemic index effect, a different effect metabolically. But yeah. I, I always am a fan of going to the original form for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you've also got like these soups, you have a nacho broccoli soup that I'm just like, Oh my God, I can't wait to try that. You've got a, you've got a one pot staples soup. So it's the same core ingredients. And then you on the other side of the page, you have like five different spice blends that you add to it to give it either Mexican or Italian or, you know, whatever. It's, it's, I think it's brilliant. Don't you love the idea? Cause I, people think it's like, oh, what do you eat on a plant-based side? And I always want to say, oh my gosh, you could eat everything. And the flavors will like anything you love and you go around the world and you, you take like the soup or like a bowl of rice and beans, and you can completely transform it to completely different flavors. And so then yeah. there's infinite variety. Infinite, infinite. And then in, in pans, and I, I, I just have to say this because I went through every recipe and marked the ones that I want to try. And for you have a smoky sweet potato mac and cheese that I can't wait to try with my whole family. It just is like crazy good. Oh, I hope you like it. Yeah, that's like it's hard for me to get my kids to eat the way I want them to eat, and that's one way is a mac and cheese uh, world. They love mac and cheese anything. So yeah, I hope you like it. And then, as I told earlier, you know, last night I had a lentil oat loaf. What I love these, I love loaves, and you have a spicy chickpea loaf that I'm like Jones and to try. Looks <laughs> um, and then another thing I posted on it on Instagram, maybe a week or two ago, but the, you have potato croutons and what yeah. really, what really drew me to your potato croutons is how you make them and you boil that, boil them first, which is brilliant. And then you put them out on the saucepan on the uh, parchment paper and then you bake them, but then you have, you get the soft inside that way and the crunchy outside. Yes. Yeah, those were so much fun. And I put them in different, like I have the, like I love rye bread. I grew up 
eating rye bread. And so I made rye potato croutons and put them in my tempeh Reuben salad. So it's kind of like yeah. you get the rye bread taste and crunch without yeah. the bread. It's more, it's more wholesome, right? More nutritious. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then another one of my favorite uh, dishes and you've got a, it looks amazing is a sog paneer. Um, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, <laughs> but, but I, think it, I think it's a sag or so. I don't know. It sounds right to me. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's got that kind of, it's cheesy, it's spinachy. It's a very, like, I think, um, um, a very popular Indian dish, but it typically comes with cheese. Right. And, and, and that's mixed in with all this spinach and different spices, but yours looks phenomenal. And oil, that used to be my favorite. I used to love, Indi I always love Indian food, but I, before I was vegan, that was one of my favorite dishes was sag paneer and with the biryani yeah. and everything. So yeah, so this is like an oil free, cause you know, it's usually like cooked in lots of delicious, like yes. all the spices, but like immersed in oil. So this is obviously an yeah. oil free vegan version. Yeah, I want, I want to take a break from the recipes for a second uh, <clears throat> because my mouth is starting to water. And <laughs> let's go back. We, in the very beginning, we talked about exercise. So tell me why your advice suggestion to your clients when they're starting to work with you is to not exercise. I know it's really disruptive and crazy sounding because I mean, especially I was a personal trainer for, I'm still a personal trainer, 20. It's been, oh my gosh, rip <laughs> this year. I'm renewing my thing this month and it's since 98. What is that? 24 years. I can't believe it. It's crazy. So yeah, um, it sounds crazy coming from someone like me. And that's what I learned in grad school. You have to exercise, you have to exercise, but you can't out exercise a bad diet. And the thing where I see the most conflict of this idea with this weight loss process is exercise drives appetite. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. You know, I mean, you were, you're an elite athlete. So taking a break from it, you're not going to lose everything. You're not going to lose all your gains by going through. Again, the people that are rapid firing this weight loss process, it's a, a finite period of time. The people that are always on a diet, the roller coaster, it's like, of course you have, you can't stop exercising forever because it's the most important thing for your mental health, for your cardiovascular health, for your immune system, everything. Exercise is extraordinary. I don't want to minimize the beyond powerful benefits to exercising consistently. But with weight loss, if you just take this period of time, you just chill out a little bit. I have my, like I say, please go just binge watch TV and read books and do whatever, like do other things that you wanted to do and just take it easy for a little while. You'll be fine. If you need to stretch or do physical therapy or a little bit of walk it outside, it's all fine. But if you're sitting there like hustling and doing intensive cardio and, you know, hit workouts and, you know, all those things that we're doing, it just slows down the process. And I found honestly, back to anecdote, there's science to support this. But back to anecdote with my clients, it halves their rate of loss every time. Wow. I wow. know. Bizarre. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because I, I, I know um, people that I have worked with who like one individual, for example, who lost 110 pounds over the span of a year and he had a bum knee. So he literally didn't exercise for that whole year. And I mean, it's just, again, more evidence that you can lose the weight uh, and it's all about the food. <laughs> it's not about, it's not about the exercise. Cause you can't, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. And I bet, his knee, I bet his knee was better afterwards. Cause he had a break from all the exercise and uh, hundred pounds less on the knee. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure of that. Um, okay. Let's talk for a sec about food journals. Do you recommend mm -hmm. that your clients keep a food journal and why? Well, it's another tool. It's another tool for accountability. Like if you have to, if you're going to eat it, you're going to have to write it down. You know, it's like, okay, there's something that goes on in your head. Yeah. Uh, that's one part of it. The second part is it's a historical reference so that you can go back to see what works and what doesn't work. And most importantly, for my purposes, by the way, the reason I became a dietitian is because I love reading people's food journals. Like I'm so nosy. <laughs> like I'm fascinated. <laughs> like I love looking at people's carts at the market, yeah. the grocery stores. But um, it's I look at trends. If you tell me, oh, I'm eating healthy, I'm like, really? Let me see a food journal. And there's always a reason for every. I could always look at a food journal and know what the client's gonna say ahead of time. I could always. It's very predictable, fascinating, 
but tr you look for trends. I do this with my clients for everything. If they have an allergy or an intolerance, because I don't do just weight loss. I work with people that are trying to reverse chronic conditions or deal with GI problems or allergies or all sorts of other things that come up. And so watching for the trends, watching blood pressure trends and all that stuff, it's really the, a powerful tool to just write it down. Because how many of us remember exactly what we ate, mm -hmm. you know, for, mm -hmm. for lunch? Yeah. No, I love everything you just said. I know whenever, you know, with the people that we work with, when I was writing uh, both my first book and my third book, and I had pilot study participants, it was absolutely mandatory that they keep a food, a food journal for course corrections and also for accountability. So big, big fan of that as well. Um, let's talk about maintenance, maintenance phase. So you've gotten somebody to lose the weight, right? They've, they've lost the 20, 30, 50, hundred pounds, but now the key is keeping it off. Right. That's and everything. Yes. So how do, how do, how do you keep your clients from resisting the temptation to return to old habits? So this is where the diet begins. This is where the magic happens. This is where you get off the roller coaster because most people have lost weight. Most people know how to lose weight. It's the making it part of your life. And so we set boundaries. So I, I stepwise into maintenance mode with exercise. So that's where we go. Okay. Now, and it, it's so funny because all the clients that for years have been like, I don't want to exercise. I can't exercise. This hurts. That. Now they're begging me by the end of this, please, can I start exercising? I'm like, okay, see? Nice. So we stepwise into it very conscientiously and methodically with exercise. And that's how we kind of, and then we, we set boundaries. So, you know, we get on the scale. I'm going to stick to whole food plant-based. I'm going to stick to twice a day eating, whatever it is that's worked for yeah. them. Yeah. We, we set those boundaries. And then it's, these are things I can do. These are things I love to do. These are things that have transformed my life and I'm going to continue these. So we find these, we, we kind of hone these over the process during weight loss. And then we set the, the standards for here on out. What about, um, do you have any advice or recommendations for people when it comes to eating out or going to friends' homes? Oh yeah. I mean, that's what we navigate throughout the whole process. That's, I mean, that's a constant challenge and it's fascinating, right? Because everyone, everyone eats, so everyone's got an opinion about food and everyone wants to tell you you're going to be deficient in protein. I mean, every day riff, I hear this every day. Still, you probably hear it every day too. It's like, really, we're, we've solved the protein thing. We're fine. Yeah. So everyone has to have an opinion. And so I try to get my clients to, I always tell people it's, it's, the goal is to just not have the conversation because pe you're not really people don't care about protein and they don't really know what that means and how much you're supposed to have. And most people are just throwing stuff out there that they heard. So the idea is to try to not talk about it, which is really hard, you know, like, yeah. you know, anyone that's plant based, everyone. And then someone that's not, they sit down, they want to talk about it. What I do for a living, everyone wants to talk to me about diet, no matter how hard I try to like stave yeah. off the topic. So trying to not talk about it is really important. And then making, knowing what you're going to eat having a plan. If, if you haven't eaten, are you going to bring food? Are they going to have food for you? Are you going to offer to, so just navigating the situation best you can when you're going to someone's house. If you're going to a restaurant, you can look up, uh, I always say, put on your green goggles, look at the mm -hmm. menu ahead of time, look at the menu, like even at a steakhouse, I have in my first book, I wrote like getting something, finding something even at a steakhouse. It's, you know, look at the side dishes. What do they have in the kitchen? And you could piece together a meal, worst case scenario. There's always something, especially yeah. nowadays. There's always yeah. something. Yeah. But all in all, their safest bet as much as possible eat at home 100 yeah. percent. yeah yeah um you have this let's go through these before we i want to return to the recipes um and then i'm going to let you have your celery stock <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> um and that is you have the six daily threes and and the first one is three servings of green leafies you know that at plant strong because of my father's influence, we are huge fans of kale, Swiss chard, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you like them too. Why? Kale, yeah, I love them. They're the most nutritionally dense foods. I recently, yeah, look at that cool. I love, I need that shirt. I have to get one like that. Um, I, the, I added cruciferous to that category because yeah. there's some that are, there's a lot of overlap. Like kale is a cruciferous and a leafy green, broccoli, cauliflower, all that stuff. Well, 
cauliflower is a little um, not green, but yeah. So I have those as the most important category because of the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet. The fewest, you, know, you get the most nutritional bang for your caloric buck. And yeah. there's like this wide array of phytonutrients and health benefits to eating these foods. So you can't get enough of the leafy greens. Obviously we're on the same page about that. I'll never forget my first interview with your dad when I did a movie 12 years ago and he did his leafy green song. It was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah. That's, his, <laughs> that's his green leafy wrap. Um, okay. You also ask people to do three servings of fruit. And okay. when you say, and when you say a serving, what does that mean? Like what's a serving of thank you uh, for asking this. And so here again, without the counting, right? So here I am trying to navigate what you should eat and then also not counting. And so the six daily threes is a mnemonic. It's an idea. It's like, how do we prioritize the foods? Cause I want people to eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices and infinite tasty combinations. But how do you prioritize them for nutrition? So there is no perfect diet. And like someone like me, who's 115, 120 pounds, versus a 180 pound athlete that needs to eat more. We're not supposed to be eating the same amount of food every day. We're like, right. There's a difference. And so it's a guideline. There's no perfection. And you can, you know, so a serving is about uh, for fruit. It's one, one piece, or I think it's a cup. I don't have it in front of me. And then for yeah. vegetables, it's a cup of raw or a half a cup cooked. Cause I shrink so much, but again, these are foods in the six daily threes, like nuts and seeds and mushrooms and, uh, the leafy greens that are nutritionally unique legumes that you can't get these things elsewhere. Notable on there, missing, everyone points this out. And I think it's important. I don't have whole grains on there. Nothing at all wrong with whole grains. They're fabulous, fabulous health benefits, nutritionally dense, wonderful, culinarily diverse, satiating, but there's nothing unique in whole grains that you can't get elsewhere. So that's what that's all about. Not like you have to eat all of this every single day and be, you know, be perfect about it. It's just like, these are things to make sure you're getting in or on a regular basis. Well, and if you're getting your three servings of green leafies, three servings of fruit, three servings of legumes, which we adore, three servings of colored veggies, three servings of nuts and seeds, and three servings of mushrooms, you're not going to have much room for anything else. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> yes. So speaking of which, let's go back into some, some, uh, some recipes that I wrote down that I want to make. You have a chili cheese fries that I'm going to make because my kids are going to gobble it right up. And, and, and do you know off the top of your head, because I know you're not looking at the recipe and I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but what is your cheese sauce made from? Oh, no, I know that one because I make it all the time. I put that on everything. It's basic. The main ingredient is, well, cashew. Yep. And I, although I've been mixing up my nuts and seeds now just to get more nutritional variety in there, just every time I make it, because I use a lot of cashew because it's like the creamy neutral one. But I started kind of like hum, like mixing up my nuts and seeds in those recipes. And then roasted red pepper. So that makes it this vibrant color. It's so vibrant. And it like bright orangey, you know, it's, I yeah. love the color and the flavor. And it's like, it adds, it acts as the liquid because it blends, it makes it blend because it's so, there's so much water in a roasted red pepper and so much flavor. And then um, I think that one, I've done a few versions of this. I, one of them was, my first one was in Forks Over Knives book. And I think that it's like hit with like a little hit. It's something hot in there. Is there's uh, one of them, cayenne or smoked or chipotle? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. yeah paprika or chili powder or cayenne, something like that. Yeah, and then good. this one, this one on page 112, this almond crusted tofu, like my, one of my kids' favorite things is tofu. And we love um, doing a panini like style tofu where we put it in that panini maker. And so I cannot wait to try this with my kids. You have Tex-Mex stuffed peppers that I know my wife and I will love kids, you know, they, they haven't expanded their repertoire to where they're going to appreciate that as much. Um, I, so then, I, just, I make the stuffing, the fiesta cauliflower rice. Like, well, they made me take off fiesta, but I love that word fiesta. Um, I, I use that. I just make that all the time with the cheese and I eat that almost every day. Like the yeah. just stuffing without putting, I make it fancy in the peppers when I have guests and I'm entertaining, but yeah, that's one of my yeah. favorite staples. Nice. I was, uh, I had a meeting yesterday with our graphic uh, design team and one of the guys, he showed me this book that he just purchased. It's called, um, salad freak, <laughs> right? Salad freak. And I was like, I love that because people, people have like, for whatever reason, been 
been papooing the salad, right? And yeah. you have, and what I love is in your power bowl section, you, I'd say 80% of your power bowls are all insane salads. So you like, you have a Buffalo cauliflower salad, a forbidden sushi salad. It's basically like bring on the salad. And these are muscular salads. Yeah. I mean, what the heck people just think of, I mean, we have such a sad interpretation of like a salad and it could be anything, you know, you could put anything you love into a big bowl, which is what I'm going to do right after this. And it's amazing. You have so much, again, infinite variety and it should be hearty and delicious and it doesn't have to be boring and drab. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so speaking of boring and drab, one of the things to help prevent uh, plant-based dishes from being boring and drab are secret sauces. And you've got a litany of them. You've got a hemp seed ranch dressing. I can't wait to try a carrot ginger dressing, spicy peanut dressing that to me would go, go well on just about anything. You have a harissa butternut squash hummus. Wow. Stop me. And then, and then you even have like a simple marinara sauce for people just to put on their pasta. So 75 inc incredible recipes. I can't even imagine how much time you spent, you know, getting all these to where they made it into the book, but congrats. Thank you so much. It's exciting to hear you talk about it. I, I, again, I could hear you talking about food all the time. It's very fun. <laughs> um, let's talk for a second. And then I, I do, I do need to let you go because um, I've got a call that I'm supposed to be on here in <laughs> five minutes. And this has been so fun is what about cheat days? What's your philosophy on cheat days? Are you, are, do you allow your clients to have like a, a cheat Saturday or Sunday when they've been good for five or six or seven days? Thank you for ending on this note. I love this. I don't like the concept of cheat days because that whole idea of if you're cheating, you're only cheating yourself. But I, I like to call it, and I, I put a positive framework on it and I call it a day of deliciousness. And rather than think of it as I'm doing something bad, like I want you to love your food all the time, 365 days of the year, you should love your food. Like the way you just talked about it, that's how mm -hmm. I feel about it. Like you always, the way, the reason I love listening to you talk about it all the time is because it's like how I feel about food too. It's like, it's, those foods are amazing. They taste delicious. Like we love to eat. We're not just suffering and, and eating those celery sticks like rabbits. We're just enjoying our food. So I want you to love your food all the time. So you don't have to cheat on yourself by eating something that you love because you're always eating foods you love. Like that's the goal. Find the foods you love. That's the first step that I do with my clients. And the second part of that is if it's a holiday, if it's someone's birthday, if you haven't seen, because there's always something to celebrate, but choose it conscientiously. If you're always eating decadent foods, it's not decadent anymore. It's not a treat anymore, right? It's, it's uh, your day. Uh, it's how you eat. So if you're going to have something more decadent, like your the ice cream that's in your freezer or whatever it is, plan it and then don't regret it. Enjoy every bite of it. Radical self-compassion. Enjoy it. Eat it. Enjoy it. Like let it sit in your mouth and chew it and taste it and celebrate it. And then the next meal, you go back to being on plan and then no harm, no foul. It's a win-win yeah. situation. Yeah. I like it a lot. Let's wrap up with this. Um, you're a big fan, and I've heard this this word a lot lately. Uh, gratitude, and ha you you recommend people have a gratitude list uh, for what they're grateful for. What what exactly? What's the reason for that? Thank you for asking that. <laughs> gratitude for you asking that. There's a lot going on in this world, and life is not so easy all the time. In fact, it's very challenging a lot of the time for most people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking personally, speaking globally, I, I could only speak for myself and people I've worked with. If you take, if you try to remember the things that you do have and you focus, you know, whatever you focus on expands in your world. And if you could focus on the things you're grateful for, that will fill your life more because there's always something to be upset about or stressed about. Or, you know, I have a teenage daughter who's always complaining about something and someone and everything. But if you can focus on the things that you're grateful for and remember and like actually write it down, because again, words are so powerful, it has more of the potential to expand and to become the focus of your life is just the things that you're grateful for. The little things like I have my fuzzy slippers and I have my vanilla tea and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to get to spend time with you here, Rip. Thank you for having me here again. I love talking to you always. And it's just these little things or big things, whatever they are collectively 
that is who you become, what you focus on. And so that's what I try to encourage my clients to focus on more. Yeah. You're so, you're so right. Anybody can complain and whine and just bitch about things that are not going well. But if you kind of pivot and you think about the things you're grateful for, as you've said several times throughout this conversation today, practice radical self-compassion. Let's be grateful for what we have. Let's do our best to love ourselves. I think we're going to be in a better place. And let's follow those 10 tenets for sustainable weight loss. <laughs> yeah. now. All right. I am so grateful for you, Juliana, for joining uh, joining me today on the Plant Strong Podcast and for putting this brilliant piece of work out into the universe. Huge, huge congrats to you. And um, I'll so hope to see you soon. Uh, you brought chills to me. Thank you so much, Rip. I'm so grateful. And I hope to see you again soon. Yes. And enjoy your breakfast, lunch. Thank you. <laughs> plantbaseddietitian.com is the website where you can learn all about Juliana's programs and books. Of course, we'll be sure to link to that and all of the resources from today's episode on the episode page at plantstrongpodcast.com. Next week, we're in the kitchen with food blogger and father of five, Shane Martin. But until then, choose you now and now and now and always keep it plant strong the plant strong podcast team includes carrie barrett Lori cordowich amy mackey patrick gavin and wade clark this season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.